Next slide. So this event is being brought to you by the Adolescent and Young Adult Health National Resource Center. And we are very grateful for the support and the funding from our Maternal and Child Health Bureau uh, through this cooperative agreement, which you see here. And the lead organization is uh, the National Adolescent Health Information Center, or NAHIC, at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. And this is part of the Adolescent and Young Adult Health National Capacity Building Program. Next slide. And you can find out more information about this resource center by um, visiting nahic.ucsf.edu slash resource center. And we wanna acknowledge that the contents of this presentation are of our featured panelists today and do not necessarily represent the official views nor an endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the US government. And without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to one of our panelists today, Amber. Next slide, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us today. This town hall is going to cover some topics surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines and also immunization in general, um, along with how these topics relate to the youth population, which we define here in Colorado as ages 9 to 25. Across the country, it's usually an age range that's pretty close to that. Now, while we're primarily speaking to and for younger folks, we are also pleased to see that there are many public health workers and care providers in the audience today. And we hope that this content can give you the tools to craft your own resources for talking to youth in your communities about these topics. We'll also have a 15 minute Q&A panel at the end of the presentation to cover any additional questions you might have. So to talk a little bit more about who we are, I will turn it over to Gabby. Hi everyone, you are, we are the Youth Voice Amplified Committee with the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs. A little bit of background on the Association of Maternal and Child Health, otherwise known as AMSHIP, leads and supports programs nationally to protect and promote the optimal health of women, children, youth, families, and communities. Since being founded in 1950, AMSHIP has served as a national resource, partner, and advocate for state public health leaders and others working to improve maternal and child health public health systems. AMSHIP's members include leaders from the highest levels of state government, such as directors of maternal and child health and children with special health care need programs, as well as family leaders, community-based organizations, academic institutions, and others who partner with and support state maternal and child health programs. The Youth Voice Amplified Committee was formed in 2021 with a diverse group of adolescents and young adults from across the nation. We seek to amplify youth perspectives in the public health realm and show the strength in youth voices to enact long lasting change. Thank you, Gabby and Amber. Um, so yeah, so the purpose of this event, um, so we want to get across um, a better understanding, sorry, um, a better understanding of youth perspectives on the COVID-19 vaccine, um, address vaccine hesitancy and combat misinformation. Um, and as you can see um, in this graph, so before we introduce ourselves, we would like to talk about the purpose of this event. Increasing vaccination rates among young adults has been a particular challenge. The latest data shows that people ages 18 to 29 have the lowest vaccination rates of any age group. According to data collected by the Kaiser Family Foundation from 1,862 adults, they're also most likely to express hesitancy or outright refusal to get the vaccine. Additionally, disparities in vaccination rates and hesitancy across racial and socioeconomic lines are significant among young adults as they are among the population at, yard, at large. Our goal today is to better understand youth perspectives on the COVID-19 vaccine, address vaccine hesitancy, and combat misinformation. I'll kick us off. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Beck. I use she, her pronouns. I'm 18 and I'm from New Jersey. I am the co-chair along with Amber. If you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Amber Woodside. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I'm 22 from Teller County, Colorado, and I am a member of YVA primarily because I just think that young voices this deserve to be in public health spaces more often than they are. And I'm Adele Brunstad. I use she, her pronouns. I'm 20 and I'm from Vermont. Um, 
And I'm just a YBA member. I'm not a co-chair. And I'll just reflect the same thoughts as Amber too. I believe that um, youth voice should be included in um, all of the various processes that involve outcomes that we'll be involved in. So thank you for being here. And we do have two other team members that were hopefully going to join us today, but they may come in a little bit later. So we are going to start by gauging everyone's thoughts about COVID vaccines. So we're going to launch a live poll. Um, this is an anonymous voluntary survey. Your results will help us better understand perspectives on the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so please respond to the following questions when you're prompted. Have you ever received a COVID-19 vaccine? If not, what is your intent to get the vaccine or not get it? And regardless of your vaccination status, how effective do you think the COVID-19 vaccines have been in mitigating the pandemic? And how effective do you think they will be in the future? So I believe Ileana will be handling that. So hi everyone, there should be a set of three questions that have popped up on your screen to these items. Please respond when you have a chance. And again, the questions are, have you received a COVID-19 vaccine? The second question is, if not vaccinated or boosted, what is your intent to get the vaccine or boosted or not get it? And then a question on efficacy, regardless of the vac your vaccination status, how effective do you think the COVID-19 vaccines have been in mitigating the pandemic? How effective do you think they will be in the future? So please respond to those three questions when you have a moment. And we'll give everybody a few more seconds. We wanna get at least 70%. <laughs> so please go ahead and respond to these three items. A great question that came into the chat. Uh, no, you do not need to answer question two um, if you are vaccinated. Oh, I apologize. If you're not, you need to answer all three questions. I'm, I do apologize. All right, we're gonna go ahead and end the poll. And I hope everyone is able to see the results. Please let me know if you're not able to see the full results. Do any of our panelists wanna walk us through the responses we've gotten from our audience? Yeah, I can. So it looks like primarily the audience today has been vaccinated and boosted. And then on that second question, we might be seeing a little bit of bias because of the fact that we couldn't submit it without answering, even if we are vaccinated, but also largely respondents said that they will, do intend to get the, the vaccine. And then most people said that they think the vaccine has been very effective in mitigating the pandemic and will continue to be in the future. Thank you so much, Amber. It's interesting to see our predisposed stance and how that will affect um, our presentation and discussing the youth perspective um, based on vaccination and boosting. And so now I'll hand it over to um, Gabby and Amber to talk about the COVID-19 COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Adele. So as many of us probably recall, COVID was declared a pandemic in March of 2020. COVID, COVID-19, and coronavirus are the common names for a virus called SARS-CoV-2, which is a respiratory virus. The SARS family of illnesses is not new. It's a family of hundreds of different respiratory illnesses that mostly stick to animal communities, but they can spill over to the human community, which is what happened to start the COVID-19 pandemic. While this strain of the virus is new or novel, as it has often been called in the media and scientific communities, there was still much we already knew about SARS viruses when this started. 
It was this prior knowledge that let the scientific community have a quick understanding of some of the ways in which we could start to fight the spread of the virus, like social distancing and masking. One thing we didn't know for sure to begin with was the rate at which COVID could spread and ended up spreading, and especially as the new variants of the virus like Delta and Omicron have emerged, that has been even more true. It is because of this combination of initial knowledge and initial uncertainty that it probably felt for the public like prevention measures have changed too often while scientists still expected the public to trust them. But, but when we hear that the pandemic changes often, this is actually true because of how COVID has been mutating and acting differently than other SARS viruses. Another reason it's been difficult to track and stop the spread of COVID is because of the wide range of symptoms that people who get it can experience. Especially for younger people, carriers of COVID might not feel any symptoms at all, but they still can spread it to others. This is part of why masking is and has been such a huge deal throughout the pandemic. A mask contains your germs from spreading to others, not necessarily the other way around, although any face barrier can help a little bit to protect yourself as well. The most common symptoms of COVID are fever, dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, headache, and a new loss of sense of smell or taste. However, there are also common symptoms of runny noses, diarrhea, and nausea or vomiting, along with honestly a myriad of others, and all those symptoms do come with many other illnesses. And so when COVID testing became available and as it has become more accessible, those have both been huge victories in tracking the spread of the virus and allowing people to know when to quarantine. Symptoms for COVID will start anywhere between 2 and 14 days after you actually catch the virus. Because of what we know about how long the virus can live and be spread or is transmissible, based on when symptoms start or end, CDC has been able to recommend quarantine periods to ensure that someone carrying COVID won't be able to spread it anymore when they return to their normal life. For young people, this is often how contracting COVID might go. You feel a little bad or nothing at all. You might receive a positive COVID test and quarantine for a while and then return to normal. It's enough that when we're talking about a global pandemic, words like most or often means that a lot of people will still not have that experience. You can have severe COVID symptoms and become hospitalized even when you're young. That is part of why when we talk about the percentage of deaths for people who contract COVID, it can sound like a really small issue, but a low mortality rate for a virus that scientists estimate eventually 90% of people will have had at least once still means that hundreds of thousands of people will die from it. And they have in the United States and far more across the world. We don't share this information to spread fear, but to spread reality. You as an individual will end up being extremely, extremely lucky if COVID doesn't touch you, your loved ones, or your community in a serious and potentially deadly way. Next slide, please, Gabby. Getting COVID once is also no longer a guarantee that you will not get it again, especially as more variants have emerged. I'm going to get a little bit more into the science of COVID as a virus here so that we can talk about why the COVID vaccines are actually effective. The way that COVID takes hold in a body is through what the scientific community has identified as a spike protein. COVID viral cells are literally spiky little balls and the tips of those spikes can basically fake being part of your body when they latch onto one of your healthy cells in order to trick that cell into accepting the virus. Your immune system is supposed to identify the parts of your body that are actually healthy parts that belong to you and what things are viruses or bacteria that do not belong to you. When the immune system is able to do its work properly, it will identify those intruders and release specialized cells that you already have in your body to surround and kill the invading cells. However, if your immune system never gets the alert, then it will never send that security force of cells or it won't send it in time, and the invading virus or bacteria is then free to multiply and live as a colony in your body, most likely eventually causing you to feel sick or experience the symptoms of that illness. The COVID vaccine uses what's called mRNA technology. To make it easy to understand, this type of vaccine shows your immune system what invading COVID cells look like so that it can recognize it later and send that security force to get rid of it if it enters your body. The reason that some types of COVID vaccine have two shots is because the first shot is kind of a primer for your immune system. It got the email and it read it, right? The second shot is kind of a test for the immune system. Then your immune system gets to practice the instructions it got about recognizing COVID cells. And that's why often the second shot in a series causes more symptoms. Illness symptoms primarily are just the external signs that your immune system is trying to kill something, especially fever and fatigue. Boosters have also been developed because of new information the scientific community has learned about the virus and because of the virus variants. Delta and Omicron, which have been the two biggest or most well-known variants of concern since COVID started, both feature mutations in that spike protein we talked about earlier. Basically, the virus is getting smarter about how it tricks your cells when it latches on. 
Booster shots contain extra information for your immune system about these new variants and extra information about the original or older variants so that your immune system can do an even better job of identifying these foreign cells. So you might wonder why we even needed vaccines if things like social distancing, lockdowns, and masks were supposed to be helpful in the first place. And then you might also wonder why we still need those other measures if the vaccines are supposed to be effective too. Start with the first part. COVID ended up being a lot easier to spread than the scientific community was initially prepared for. Usually viruses are passed through contact with body fluids. Like if someone sneezes near you and you inhale it, or if someone coughs on their hand and touches something that you then touch and then you touch your face, it's usually the extent of it. And it's why hand washing has always been one of the best defenses against illness. Some viruses are even better at spreading though, and they can live in the aerosolized particles you breathe out. Those particles aren't something you can control because they're super fine particles that come out whenever you speak or exhale anyway. This is why the guidance for masks has changed throughout the pandemic. Initially, scientists were trying to prevent that spread through body fluids or the droplet type of spread that you might have heard it described as. And that's why we thought to begin with that hand washing distance would be enough. As the virus spread more and got worse, we began to realize that maybe even just distance wasn't enough and we should protect people from spreading droplets with a physical barrier like a cloth mask. Now we know that COVID can sometimes even hitch a ride on the aerosolized particles. And so the current recommendation is a more heavy duty mask like a KN95, which can actually catch those much smaller particles. While the vaccine is the most effective measure against COVID to date and likely will remain so, we still require these other measures for now for two reasons. First of all, vaccine uptake has been low. The vaccines are effective, but the impact on the pandemic is only as good as the amount of people that get the vaccine. Because again, we're talking about large numbers. Pfizer shot is 95% effective, which we'll talk about later. And so that means even some people who get the vaccine will still get COVID. And if a sig statistically significant portion of the population doesn't have the vaccine and they get it, even from a vaccinated person, the virus then just starts spreading through that community almost as fast as it did before. Secondly, COVID is serious enough and deadly enough that it really is best to keep trying to prevent it with everything we reasonably can until it gets under control. It has been a serious miscommunication that COVID is just like the flu and something we can just live with forever like the flu, especially because a growing number of people who get COVID are experiencing life-changing symptoms like heart conditions or brain fog for a very long time after the virus clears from their system. Now Gabby is going to tell us a little bit about the statistics behind va vaccine efficacy and barriers to accessing vaccines. Thank you so much, Amber. There are three types of COVID vaccines that are authorized, that are authorized, excuse me, or approved for use in the United States to prevent COVID-19. The Pfizer, Moderna, and J and J. They all have varying effect effectiveness. Pfizer and Moderna, 95 to 94, relatively the same, um, but they do differ on the number of days between shots. Um, while the J and J is one shot, Pfizer and Moderna, sorry, but not Moderna, Moderna are two shots, um, and both RNA vaccines. And they both have been approved for the number of time, but as Amber, Amber addressed, um, the scientific community had been working on vaccines of this type for years prior. Um, yeah, uh, Amber, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to talk briefly also about adverse events. I think this is something we've heard a lot about in the media, and it's one of the biggest sources of concern and hesitancy for people is what if this vaccine is supposed to help me actually hurts me? And one of the biggest sources that media uses in terms of reporting adverse events is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Which makes sense, right? However, there's something that a lot of people don't understand about this reporting system. And it's that the reporting system is A, self-reported often. So you're trusting people to report accurately an adverse event that they experienced and to know that it came from the vaccine. And then also in this system, it is required that if someone experienced an adverse event following the vaccine, it has to be reported whether or not it came from the vaccine. So people dying from car crashes after they've received the vaccine are being added into this event reporting system. It's just the way that the data is supposed to be handled. And then we hear that data coming from the media. And it sounds like adverse events are a much bigger deal than they are. And I know I talked earlier about large numbers and how when even a small number of the population is experiencing something, it's still a lot of people. However, in hard numbers, not just in percentages, it really is an extremely small number of people that experience any kind of adverse event from these vaccines. And I'll hand it back to Gabby.
In this next slide, I'm going to be talking about access barriers. Young Invincibles, a national organization, recently released data, a data report discussing young adults' motivations and issues to access related to the COVID-19 vaccine. It is important to address barriers to receiving the vaccine. Some teens may not be given consent by their parents or guardians, unable to make a vaccine appointment, lack of transportation, or have difficulty navigating through misinformation. Although um, Youth Voice Amplified, YVA, doesn't have control over language access and transportation, we want to combat misinformation and provide accurate information. Thank you, Gabby. So boosters, if we need a booster shot, are the vaccines working? Um, so everyone ages 12 years and older should get a booster after receiving the vaccine. Although it is not necessary to get a booster, a booster shot enhances or restores protection against COVID-19, which may have decreased over time. This chart details when to get the booster, depending on whether you receive the Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J. You might be asking yourself if we need a booster shot, are the vaccines working? The answer is yes. COVID-19 vaccines are working well to prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and death. However, public health experts are starting to see reduced protection over time against mild and moderate disease, especially among certain populations. So this is a quote from a young person about their feelings on the vaccine. It says, personally, I feel like I don't need it. If everyone else gets it, I don't need it. We don't know what the long-term effects of the vaccine might be. I'm a healthy 21-year-old. I don't think I need it. So this feels like a common sentiment. I, I've heard it from peers in my community too, even. And first and foremost, as we've addressed, even if you're healthy, even if you're young, you can still get COVID and you can still have severe symptoms or death. And you, you deserve health and you deserve to be able to you know, continue living. Um, so that is a good motivation to get it anyway. But also you put your high risk and elderly community members at even greater risk by being an asymptomatic carrier. If you're healthy, young, you remain healthy and asymptomatic, but you carry COVID, you can take it to the older folks and the immunocompromised folks in your immediate circle and in your community, and they do not have that same healthy immune system that keeps them asymptomatic, and so they can experience severe symptoms or death themselves. Additionally, the, sim the sentiment of if everyone else gets it, I don't need it, is something that's widespread, and so right now we just have too many people saying if everybody else gets it, I don't need it, which means that everybody else is not getting it. As we begin to address the counterpoints, we're gonna play a short game, Myth versus Facts, Vaccine Edition, um, in an effort to combat misinformation and address our and address false information that we have um, ran into in media and through peers and our communities. So you can write your responses in the chat as we go along or just keep it in your head, but we'll begin the myth versus facts game. Thank you. Yes, so this was Gabby's brilliant idea, but um, I will go through the myths and facts and then um, feel free after I list each um, point to just go into the chat and type in what you think. I'll leave a few seconds um, after I say the line um, and you can give your input and then I will say whether it's a myth or a fact. So the first one, the COVID-19 vaccine can alter my data, alter my DNA. Um, what do you all think? Do you think that's a myth or a fact? Seeing lots of people saying myth. Then we got a few facts and a true in there. Great. Okay, so I will go ahead and read the response. So it is a myth. Um, COVID-19 vaccines do not change or interact with your DNA in any way. Both messenger RNA or mRNA, and viral vector COVID-19 vaccines work by delivering instructions or genetic material to our cells to start building protection against the virus that causes COVID-19. The genetic material delivered by mRNA vaccines never enters the nucleus of your cells, which is where your DNA is kept. 
Viral vector COVID-19 vaccines deliver genetic material to the cell nucleus to allow our cells to build protection against COVID-19. However, the vector virus does not have the machinery needed to integrate its genetic material into our DNA, so it cannot alter our DNA. All right, thank you everyone for participating in that one. So the next one is um, getting a COVID-19 vaccine is a safer and more dependable way to build immunity to COVID-19 than getting sick with COVID-19. Do you think that's a myth or a fact? Most people are saying fact. Got a couple false. Great, thank you everybody. So that is indeed a fact. Um, COVID-19 vaccination causes a more predictable immune response than infection with the virus that causes COVID-19. Getting a COVID-19 vaccine gives most people a high level of protection against COVID-19 and can provide added protection for people who already have COVID, who already had COVID-19. One study showed that for people who already had COVID-19, those who did not get vaccinated after, the, after their recovery are more than two times as likely to get COVID-19 again than those who get fully vaccinated after their recovery. All COVID-19 vaccines currently available in the United States are effective at, pre at preventing COVID-19. Getting sick with COVID-19 can offer some protection from future illness, sometimes called natural immunity, but the level of protection people get from having COVID-19 may vary depending on how mild or severe their illness was, the time since their infection, and their age. All right, and moving on to the next one. The COVID-19 vaccine can affect women's fertility. What do you all think, myth or fact? Mostly falses so far. We got a true. Okay, looks like that's it for the chat. So that is a myth. The COVID-19 vaccine will not affect fertility. The truth is that the COVID-19 vaccine encourages the body to create copies of the spike protein found on the coronavirus's surface. This teaches the body's immune system to fight the virus that has that specific spike protein on it. And last but not least, um, researchers rushed the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, so its effectiveness and safety cannot be trusted. We got a lot of fast falses there. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And it is a myth. Studies found that the two initial vaccines are both about 95% effective and reported no serious or life-threatening side effects. There are many reasons why the COVID-19 vaccines could be developed so quickly, including the fact that the COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna were created with a method that has been in development for years. So the companies could start the vaccine development process early in the pandemic. And that concludes our myth versus fact little session. Um, so I'll hand it over to the next YB member. Thank you, everybody. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about other types of immunizations because obviously COVID is not the only disease and illness in the world. Measles, mumps, and whooping cough might seem like quaint old illnesses confined to 19th century novels, but more and more teens are being exposed to them, especially in schools and on college campuses where large numbers of people are together in close quarters. Not only is it important to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, it is also important to receive the immunizations listed here. In addition, the CDC says it is safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine along with other vaccines at the same time. So while protecting yourself from COVID-19, you can catch up on other immunizations. I actually did that myself for my booster shot. I also got my first HPV vaccine and my second in the series of Hep A and B vaccines. Um, along with these illnesses that can spread easily throughout an entire community, Diseases like hepatitis A and B and HPV can spread more intimately, especially HPV. 
HPV is an extraordinarily common sexually transmitted infection. And while most of the time it clears from your body by the time you're 25, sometimes it can linger and cause cancer for people of all sexes and genders. While it's ideal to get the HPV vaccine around 11 or 12, you can get it at any time if your parents didn't have you get it when you were a kid. And the sooner the better, especially if you're sexually active. The HPV vaccine can prevent over 90% of cancers caused by the virus. And as far as flu shots go, even if you don't get sick often, it is a great, excuse me, a great idea still to get the annual shot. I know from personal experience that even getting the flu once can put you out of work or school for a really long time. I was out of work for two weeks a few years ago with a fever of over 104 for most of that two-week period. It was super miserable. And flu shots are available at pretty much any public health office and many big box stores with pharmacies like Walmart and Walgreens, with only real downside of getting it being that you might feel kind of gross for a couple of days. Now I'm going to hand it over to Gabby to talk about your rights as a minor in different states when it comes to getting immunized. Perfect, thank you. So minors can receive some healthcare services without parental consent. However, the majority of states require minors to have parental consent to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. However, no, some states allow teens at varying age to get vaccinated without parental consent. For example, any minor that is 14 or older in Alabama does not need parental consent to receive the vaccine. This is very important to know for youth who are interested in taking their own steps to protect their health. Um, as you can see, there's a limited number of states who don't require parental consent or you can get the vaccine, but at varying ages, including Oregon, Washington State, Idaho, Arkansas, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee. So we see that in most states, you do have to have parental consent to get an immunization. So we're going to talk about a unique challenge. If you're a minor and your parents are the ones having vaccine hesitancy, but you've decided you want to get it, how do you handle that? Adele? So if you are a teen whose parents are hesitant about the COVID-19 vaccine, don't lose hope. You're not alone. Many parents who aren't anti-vax want to be reassured that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe for their teens and tweens. There's a lot of misinformation out there and it could be worrisome for them. So here are the tips and resources to talk to your parents. First and foremost, it's really important to be informed. You can check out trusted resources to know why doctors are recommending the COVID-19 vaccine and ways to disprove vaccine myths. It'll prepare you for everything you need and all basically our myth versus facts game that the vaccine has been proven safe and many, many teens are getting it and doing it to protect their communities, loved ones, friends, everything of that nature. So yes, um, talk to your parents or guardian when they are relaxed. Find a time when your parents are relaxed, you know them best. If they seem stressed or busy, it is clearly not the time to talk about why you want something they may not want for you. Um, and having open communication is really important. Um, tell your parent or parents or guardians how you truly feel. Um, how you were afraid you might infect your loved ones, how teen cases of COVID-19 are rising, and although deaths, although deaths are rare, long-haul COVID-19 complications are real, as Samba mentioned before. Um, how not being vaccinated means you can't do all your favorite activities and spend time with family and friends, and why you don't want to live in fear, and how great it would be if the pandemic ends for all. This is especially important now because I live in New Jersey and they are removing the mask mandate in schools and that is a real source of fear. Um, I don't want to come home and I don't I don't want to infect anyone in my household. I live with my grandpa who is immunocompromised. So making sure that I'm being able to protect my family best and having open communication, really important in these times as states are removing those mask mandates in schools. Yes, thank you, Gabby. Um, okay, and reach out to others who can talk to your parents. Um, ask your parents or guardian if they would be willing to talk to others. You can reach out to your doctor if you know who that is, um, friends, parents, and extended family members who are vaccinating their children and can talk to your parents, um, school guidance counselor, school nurse, or a science teacher. 
Um, if your parents are religious, reach out to your religious leaders to see whether they can talk to your parents for you. Um, know that almost all religious leaders support vaccines. So to summarize, be gently persistent with your parents or guardians. This is your health. Obviously, you have a relationship with your parents, hopefully a close one, hopefully a loving one. But this is your body, your life. And just continue talking to your parents about how you feel. You know, your, care, your parents care about you. And so they want to do what's best for you. And that's probably where their hesitancy is coming from in the first place. So if you can teach them that it's not going to be dangerous for you, then that would be best. So share the resources you have, share resources like this, share resources from reliable sources like the CDC, the National Institute for Health, the World Health Organization, people who do this for a living and know what they're talking about. And just encourage conversation with other people that your parents also trust. Yes, and so um, extra resources. And so also to highlight um, what Amber said also about this um, webinar itself being a great resource um, to come back to, it will be recorded and sent out to the participants. Um, so that's a great resource as well. Um, and other resources are CDC's short paper on common questions from parents. Um, there's a minor consent laws by state and where to get vaccines um, by teensforvaccines.org um, and why doctors are recommending the COVID-19 vaccine for teens. Um, and this slide deck will also be sent out to the participants um, so you can reference these links as well. And now it is time for the Q&A section of this event. We have allotted about 15 minutes. We have some questions from the Zoom registration that we're going to address. And also please start to leave any questions you may have in the chat. If you want, you can also unmute. Either, either or whatever is easy for everyone to address their questions or any comments, concern. So Kat Stark wrote in the chat, for high schoolers or teenagers, do their views on COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine generally align with those of their parents? I think it's situational. Um, some people, some teenagers will align with their parents' views, others not. Um, it just really depends on the household. If anyone else has anything they wanna add. In my community, um, and just to provide context, I live in an extremely rural community. Um, I've seen primarily that teens don't align with their parents' views on it, but they don't want to go against their parents. They don't want to create turmoil. And so they just kind of take the stance that like, well, I'll probably be okay. And my parents really don't want me to get it. So I'm just going to leave it alone. And they kind of carry that as they turn 18 and start into that transition age. They still don't want to cause strife with their parents. Um, so they, they continue not to receive it once they've become an adult. I would agree with that also. Um, I also live in a rural community in Vermont. And um, I think too, yeah, they're not wanting to cause conflict. Um, I hear I hear a lot of kids say, oh, well, um, people get sick even if they have the COVID-19 vaccine, that's kind of like their solid excuse and then they, they don't get it. I hear that a lot. Um, and I find also it, it can depend too on how um, uh, politically vocal families are. I found, um, people, if they aren't inclined to politics, then it's more um, moderate views, um, not as strong opinions versus if a family is more politically vocal. I also have a question from Sabrina. Um, do you have any advice for public health practitioners to help discuss the vaccine with adolescents and how to help them with misinformation? Um, my response to that would be to really highlight unbiased sources because everybody's got their media diet right they've everything kind of becomes an echo chamber especially on social media and so you're seeing all the same views and so if you bring it back to that objective these are the statistics this is the science i think that can be really helpful because young people have the capacity to grasp that 
you know, make sure you're assuming competence for the young people that you're talking to. They can understand this stuff. And also I would highlight some of the impacts to their daily lives. Like you don't want to miss school, the quarantine. You don't want to miss work because you got a, a positive COVID test, that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you so much, Amber. I think it's just important to me, teens and young adults where they are, understand the barriers, whether that's an internet issue, time issue, language barrier, uh, language barrier. It's just really important to understand where teens are coming from, under understand their perspective, and try to get them to also. I think Gen Z, we're all really socially minded and community minded. We are really eager to uplift our communities. And if you highlight that fact that through the vaccine, we can protect our communities, our loved ones, those living in the house, our friends, that's a really important point just to capitalize on the social minded energy and pursuit of Gen Z. And I'll just add on to that really quickly too. I think that, um hearing uh, other youth talk about combating misinformation, like we are in this webinar can be um, really helpful too. So using this, these sort of resources as um, a, re a reference point could be helpful as well. Uh, in response to the question about needle phobia from teens, um, my primary recommendation on that would be to just stress like the shortness of the consequence, right? someone has needle phobia it is a very very short shot um there's there's not that much to say about needle phobia unfortunately but just any strategies that you might have used with even younger children um and someone put a, a resource for needle anxiety in the chat as well but any resources that you use to help younger children want to get their flu shot even if they're afraid of needles i think can still be apl applicable to the older population for this vaccine Hey, I just wanted to flag, this is Eliana. Um, I put in the chat some of the questions that we got from our registration list. If I know some of this might have been addressed earlier, but if you wanted to re re reiterate any of these points, you're welcome to do so. Um, my reasons for having been vaccinated against COVID-19 are ultimately largely personal. Like I care about my community, definitely. Um, I care about stopping the pandemic, but I live with my father. He is 62 years old. He has diabetes and smokes and has all these risk factors. Um, and I just literally wouldn't be able to live with myself if I being out in the community, having a full-time job, doing stuff out where I could catch COVID, if, if I brought it home to him and he died or was in the hospital for a long time, um, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I hadn't done everything I could to try and prevent that. And then I'll also address these two kind of cultural questions that we had live in the chat. Um, from what sources do youth populations receive most of their health information? I and my peers, it is largely social media, which again brings in the bias, you know, the algorithm is showing you what it knows you want to see. Um, but also a lot of my peers and myself, we receive a lot of health information from actually like comedy news sources. So like last week tonight with John Oliver and The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, um, information that comes in the form of, of jokes and not necessarily taking it so seriously that you can't laugh about the state the world is in is something that I've seen be very, very effective for this generation um, and, and for me particularly. And then as far as mask use, um, most youth in my community are not continuing to wear masks despite the mandates being removed. And my county has never been good at enforcing the mask mandates since they started. Um, I, I very rarely see anyone my age with a mask on, which is ultimately kind of depressing. To continue that point, um, the mask mandate um, ends next week in New Jersey, and all the kids are already talking about how they're going to take it off immediately. And for kids who do want to keep it on, it is a source of social anxiety because you're going to be the only kid in the room that's going to wear the mask, and then you're kind of ostracized. And um, it's just an important point to bring up because it, it almost makes caring about your health uncomfortable or different. 
And I don't think that's how kids and teens who want to protect not only themselves, the people in their household, their community. Um, I personally believe in the mask mandate and making sure that um, all students are able to protect their health and don't feel uncomfortable if they're the only one in the room wearing the mask. But it, it is what it is. If anyone has anything else to share. Yeah, to that point, like if you're an adult in a community, if you care about the mask mandate and if you think we should continue wearing them, lead by example, first of all, don't make that young person the only person in the room wearing a mask. And also I would say in ways that you can just call out people that are still masking in a positive way, right? Be like, and not necessarily publicly, right? But just if you have a couple of students that are still doing it, if you have a couple of patients that are still doing it, when they come in, just mention to them like, hey, thank you for continuing to wear the mask. Like, this is a good idea. I appreciate you for caring. You know, that, that can go a long way to helping reduce the stigma of being someone who wants to be a little bit safer. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Let us know if you have any other questions. We'd love to answer them. Um, it, was such, it was so great to hear from your questions and understand the youth perspective. Um, if anyone doesn't have anything else, we'll move on, but please feel free to leave anything in the chat. Thank you so much. Yes, of course, we will provide the sources for your data and you'll have all the slides, Zoom recording, all the works. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you so much for listening. Let us know if you have any questions. You can contact us at youthvoice at amship.org. Um, or if you ever want to hear from us, any of our perspectives, include us in any presentations, anything of that nature, feel free to contact this email address. We would also like to thank everyone that helped make this vaccination town hall possible including the Adolescent and Young Adult Health National Resource Center, AMSHIP, and staff, as well as our YVA liaison. Thank you so much, Ileana, for all your hard work and dedication, as well as all the YVA members. It's been such a great experience to collaborate with youth from across the country with um, very diverse communities and backgrounds to create um, a public health initiative. But thank you so much to everyone who helped make this a reality and everyone who attended. Let us know if you have any other final questions. And whilst we can, we still have time for some questions. If, um, and thank you, Gabby. Uh, we have an evaluation survey and I, I plugged it into the chat. I'll do it one more time. We'd love to know your thoughts. And so it will, according to SurveyMonkey, it will take five minutes to complete. So you can click on that link, do it right now. That is your golden ticket out of here. You can scan the QR code on the screen and it will take you to the mobile version of the survey. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on the content that you heard today. And also anything that you'd like to hear about in future town halls. Um, featuring young people, as well as uh, more on this subject matter, which is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, so I'm going to check the chat one more time to see if we have any additional questions. I do see some very great kudos uh, going our way to our panelists. Um, yeah, so I think with that being said, and, and thank you um, so much for sharing your resources as well in the chat. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.